2017 Artist Invitational is <laughs> it is with great pleasure that I introduce the event tonight um, for many reasons but roughly a year ago I approached artists in our fellowship uh, to consider celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation with an art exhibition and I'm, I'm happy to report that they said yes. <laughs> it's, you know, like an engagement <laughs> as announcement. <clears throat> 28 visual artists, including two filmmakers, three writers responded to the invitation. And one of the, one of the fun things about it, there's two fun things about it. One is we have an actual physical catalog, a physical catalog with pictures that was designed by one of our very own students, Carrie Henrich. She's right here, stand up, take a bow. It's a beautiful catalog, really, it's, it's amazing. And um, if you're a hoarder, you can have one. If you're a minimalist, sorry. You're going to throw it away. You're going to recycle it next week. So if you think you might keep it, actually what we really want you to do is commission the artists that are in this book. Keep it as a reference. Um, and uh, treasure it, of course. Uh, the exhibition is also online. Um, the Christ in Media Institute has the Gospel Outreach with Media, an online conference that's open right now. And the art show is part of the online conference, but there's many more speakers and um, interesting things for you, including uh, Reformation anniversary things. But so far, um, Tom, the chairman of the Christ and Media uh, Custer, the visionary that put it all together, said 380... 400. 400 visitors have gone to the art show since it's been up. And it's only been up a couple days. So that's really cool, and I have some posters if you want to grab one, just to remind you to go online and, and look, look those up. Like a true Lutheran art event, there are written explanations for all the artists. Their background as well as why they do what they do. Um, I did consider doing a bit where Luther comes back for the show to critique it, but <laughs> I scrapped the idea. There's many, an event like this, I mean, I get to stand here and introduce it, um, but there were many, many people that were involved to put an event like this together. So it's really um, a collaboration of many people from housekeeping to media to um, family. And so I, one of the things that makes me happy about it is the coming together of all those elements. Our program tonight will be first two short films and then a gallery talk by uh, Wisconsin Lutheran College Professor Paul Burmeister. So to start with, we're going to show the two short, two of the short films that were submitted. So lights up on top. Action. <coughs>
lights again for there we go. I had no idea I was in that first film. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised as you were. <laughs> um, what I would like to do, and I don't know if this will work because it's kind of semi dark, but to have so many artists come, uh, to have so many artists participating, I was wondering if the artists would be willing to stand up, those of you who, are, who were able to come. So please, if you're an artist in the show or a writer in the show, please stand up and be recognized. We'll have some time, hopefully, to meet the artists after our, our little presentation. But one of the other things we have, <clears throat> which I will be passing around, we have an, a button that says Lutheran Artist. And so if you're feeling like a Lutheran, you don't even have to be a Lutheran artist. You feel artistic. <laughs> you can have one of these. And I'm serious. I'm going to pass these around. So we have buttons that say Lutheran Artist for everyone. Not just the participants. <laughs> I like the idea. I thought it was really great. Um, the next part of our program, um, oh, by the way, the films, there's another film that is also included in this that I'll be showing on the kiosk outside if you want to watch them again. There's headphones if you want to listen to the sound or just watch them. They're playing, so for tonight anyway. Our speaker tonight is a Wisconsin Lutheran College Professor Paul Burmeister. I first met Paul when he was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He and I had the same cranky old mean professor. Which, he was meaner to Paul than he was to me, sorry. <laughs> he and I both taught part-time at, at Holy Cross when we were in graduate school, so we shared that, that common background. Uh, he received his BA in Art from Winona State and his MA and MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's currently the Associate Professor of Art and Assistant Dean of Advising at Wisconsin Lutheran College. Please welcome Paul Burmeister. Lutheran exhibition of the anniversary of the Reformation. Thank you, Bethany Lutheran College and the Art Department for supporting all aspects of the exhibition. Thanks to you, my audience, for giving up time from your schedules to spend an hour with us. My talk will be like a report or an essay. It won't be a scholarly paper on a research topic, so I'm sorry if that's what you were expecting. I have aimed this presentation squarely at college students. How many students are here, art, art students are here tonight? Good, good. Which tonight includes Bethany students and at my peers, Lutheran faculty and artists who ought to be recognized for their contributions at the anniversary of the Reformation. My presentation draws from a lifetime's experience as an art student, artist, designer, art director, educator, administrator, layperson, husband, father, grandfather, and citizen, vocations in which God has placed my flawed earthly gifts and made them perfect through the heavenly work Jesus Christ accomplished for me. My presentation results from a din dynamic and felt tension between humility and confidence, the same tension I imagine every Christian experiences in their vocations. Tonight, let's consider these four things. First, the vocation of being an art student. 
with special attention to being a Christian art student, second, the vocation of being an artist with special attention to being a Christian artist, third, what is the Christian artist to do, and fourth, is being a Christian artist 500 years after the Reformation a leap of faith? My Lutheran theology is sound, and my intention tonight is to build perspective around the accumulation of thoughts related to the doctrine of vocation. I hope you find it useful and that you will be encouraged to reflect on your situation and the situation of artists. This painting is by Beauvain, a 19th century French painter. It's in the Chase and Art Museum in Madison. It's always been a favorite of mine. I'll speak directly to those of you who are students because I want to ask what is the vocation of a student artist? And those of you who are not students can listen in. I want to be as encouraging as possible, especially in view of the heightened materialist impulse moving through higher education. I have been a participant in the culture of higher education for over 25 years, and I have never seen the vocation of student artists as misunderstood as it has been in the last 10 years. Let's review what it means to have the vocation of a student, and then look more closely at what it means to be an art student. Much of what I'm going to share here can be found previously published in essays by Corey Moss, Catherine Kleinhans, and Jean Veith. For years, in my current position, I've been telling students they have a God-pleasing vocation as students, <coughs> but it didn't occur until, to me until this past summer that I should explain to them what that means. What are the responsibilities or obligations of the student's vocation? Who calls the student, and whom does the student serve? What role does personality and unique giftedness play in their vocation? Are all student vocations equal? What is humbling and empowering about the vocation of being a student? In short, you students are called to study. Every student from every ethos or creed would probably agree that this is the obligation of the student in their vocation. The Christian student who holds the biblical account of creation as truth realizes that her intellect and intelligence were authored in her as a gift of God to all humankind. And Lutheran theologians since the Reformation have argued that education is necessary preparation and development as part of the earthly kingdom for present and future lives of service. Therefore, your calling to be a student means you will use your gifts in the present to serve your parents, peers, and teachers and your calling will prepare you to use gifts developed by your education for whatever God calls you to do in the future. Remember, you do not call yourselves because a correct understanding of vocation is that God calls all people in their vocations. And in higher education, the traditional undergraduate student continues to be called by her parents, and she's called by the admissions process of the institution she's attending, and then, when she's accepted into a major, she's called by the faculty of that major to fulfill the requirements of being a student in a particular domain. You should also remember that you have been gifted individually with interests and talents and dispositions. The Christian student sees this as part of being called by God as a person before time and being prepared to be a person in eternity. Two things to think about in connection to the personal aspect. A Christian university should work to build up every student for the good of the student and for community. And a Christian student should pay attention to thoughtful advice that is directed to her as a student. This means that the university or college encourages individual students to make selections about a major for reasons other than what is trending and popular. And this means the student should respect the thoughtful advice of a trusted professor who, for example, tells her she should think about a major in the College of Arts and Sciences. Now let me roll out how this might work for the young scholar. And I do this all the time. This is my job. Students come to my office and they, they're struggling to 
choose a major, they're struggling with the major they're in. Um, and so these questions are the kinds of questions I hear. Um, so I'm going to speak to students directly. You think you might want to make major in art, but you have some questions. Let me help you try to answer them. Here's a question. What kinds of jobs can I get with an art major? I prefer to answer this by looking at what kinds of jobs you can't get with an art major. You can't be a nurse or an accountant or a teacher, and you can't get a job that requires specialized training in its domain. But that leaves thousands of jobs where your preparation as a student artist will be valued. And did you know that there are majors in med school and law school? And most important, you should remember that you're called to be a student first. So don't let questions of career and material success derail you from being the best student you can be, which may happen most naturally and with greatest pleasure for you in the study of art. Here's another question. How will I help people by being an art major? I commend you for asking this question because it demonstrates your focus on service. And there are probably a couple of assumptions at work in this question. One assumption being that some majors prepare you to serve other people and some majors don't. Lutheran theologians were eager to dispel an aspect of this false notion by reminding us that by definition all vocations serve or help other people. So every major is geared toward preparing students for lives of service. The other assumption, I think especially common among earnest students with servant hearts, is that those majors that seem to be about helping people directly, such as nursing and education and psychology, for example, are therefore more desirable because they are more God-pleasing, or they are more pious, or they are more impactful. For this reason, many art students wonder about being art teachers or art therapists, or about minoring in art and majoring in something more noble. One of the greatest benefits of being an art major is coming to understand and practice the importance of empathy. Empathy is learned and practiced in art history, in art appreciation, in art criticism, and in art making. Centuries of proof God will find a way to use your developed and distinct gifts in art to help others. One more question. What if I'm not good enough at art to be an art major? I hope this experience, or I hope, yeah, I hope this question doesn't go back to your experiences in K-12. Your question is certainly reasonable, but my sneaking suspicion is that your way of answering this is in comparison to other people or artists, even the masters. As little children, we all draw, and then we grow up, and our self-awareness is heightened, and adults make unfortunate comments to us based on their assumption that art and music require a high level of innate, rare-like, genius talent. My answer to your question is, do you like drawing? Then draw. The writer Zola advised his undecided friend Cezanne to be either a lawyer or a painter, but never an undecided creature who spends life in inner conflict. I often advise students that it's a terrible thing to go through life merely making a living and wondering, what if? when the only thing that held them back from being an art major was a bunch of poorly informed assumptions. So, you students should take the longest view you can. The longest view remembers that God has gifted you for your vocation. God calls you to your vocation, and God assigns the value of all things. The longest view looks at your gifts from cradle to grave the longest view knows that although vocation is about the present, vocation is dynamic and it happens over time. The longest view operates in the humility of recognizing you simply can't know the future and the plans that God has for you. And it operates in the confidence God is present in every situation, hiding himself in your vocation and hiding Jesus in those you serve in your vocation. Being an art student may look ordinary, and the experience of it may seem ordinary, but God is doing extraordinary work through it.
What is the vocation of a Christian artist? You might recognize this um, painting. It's a detail of one of Bukowski's paintings. And the reason I chose it is because you can see him reflected in the um, teapot in that still life. Being a Christian art student and being a Christian artist have some things in common because both are vocations. For example, I could have reminded you students that your vocation as a student is not exclusive of other vocations. You also have vocations in your family, in your social relationships, and as employees and citizens. This applies to the vocation of being an artist, often with even greater intensity. Students, Think of your art professors and consider all the vocations they are managing simultaneously. Artist, professor, family, which can include being a parent or caring for aging parents, church layperson, volunteer, citizen. The Christian artist has a lot to manage regarding his vocation. There are so many vocational obligations and responsibilities that he must balance while trying to nurture his creative soul and continue making art. Um, on the left is Chimabui, on the, um, in the middle is Albert Durer, and then on the right is Gustave Courbet. So, what is the vocation of an artist? Going back through earliest history, the artist worked anonymously as a craftsperson, and her vocation was simply to make things, artifacts that had a specific function and observed a specific aesthetic. In the 13th century, however, artists were known as individual people, and a particular genius was associated with the exceptional quality of their work. Vasari uh, writes, in the year 1240, as God willed it, there was born in the city of Florence to the Cimabue, a noble family of those times, a son Giovanni, also named Cimabue, who shed first light upon the art of painting. While he was growing up, he was judged by his father and others to have a fine, sharp mind, and he was sent to Santa Maria Novella to a master so that he could be trained in letters. But instead of paying attention to his literary studies, Cimabue, as if inspired by his nature, spent the whole day drawing, drawing men, horses, houses, and various other fantasies in his books and papers. I find Vasari's account to be useful to understanding the vocation of an artist at this time. The artist's calling was bigger than himself, and it was willed by God. Cimabue's life of art was in service to the church. He painted panels and frescoes for churches and chapels. Indeed, Cimabue's vocation as a decorator was dependent on the church calling him to be among its many skilled artists and craftspersons. Listen to this. This is more of a sorry. As a result, his work so astonished the people of the day, since they had seen nothing better until then, that they carried it with great rejoicing and with the sounding of trumpets from Cimabue's home to the church in a solemn procession and Cimabue himself was greatly rewarded and honored. Some of us here might consider this a golden age or an apex of artistic vocation. By time of the Reformation, with rise of the middle class and transition in systems of patronage, artistic vocation could be in service to church, state, and individual private patrons. Albert Durer was commissioned for numerous important church decorations, and was pensioned by the emperor. His editions of prints and illustrations for books were sold by merchants traveling across Europe. I think it's significant that Durer is also the first artist to do numerous self-portraits, a kind of egoist exercise that may have been unthinkable until this time. The authors of the Yale Dictionary of Art and Artists write, Durer's stress on the originality of invention made possible in this marketable commodity of prints, which required no previous commission, marks him out as perhaps the first truly modern artist. My, my opinion is that a subtle but important shift in artistic vocation occurred at about this time. Artists such as Durer were called by God 
as all artists of all times have been. But now they were also, in a sense, calling themselves to do artwork for which there was no patronage as a necessary condition of its production. And then by time of the 19th century, Europe's in upheaval because of political revolutions and the consequences of so-called Enlightenment ideology and the impulses of individual liberties confuse the most basic understanding of vocation. Look to the 18th and 19th centuries to see how one's calling became a matter of personal choice and self-fulfillment. Artists were often of the um, artisan or middle class. Indeed, Renato Pagioli makes a compelling case for the view that 19th century romantic or avant-garde artists were often entrenched members of the very class, the bourgeois, that they despised. The romantics looked inside themselves and reported out what they discovered. Individual genius received primary emphasis. So consider Gustav Courbet. This is a detail from his painting, The Artist's Studio, which is very large. In 1854, Courbet refused to accept commissions for the Salon unless he was granted complete artistic liberty. When some of his works were rejected, he conceived his own show, an exhibition of realism, for 39 paintings. One of Courbet's earliest supporters noted, Courbet was prone to flattering popular taste, flattering popular taste, and shocking people at the same time. A propensity that can take us all the way to the mid 20th century and pop art movements. Uh, Jackson Pollock uh, on the left in a very famous film where a filmmaker was under glass and Pollock was painting above him. And then uh, on the right is Stephanie Behrens, a Bethany alum, right? Um, working in her studio as a Pfister artist in Milwaukee. To review, 300 years before the Reformation, it appears what the artist's vocation obligated him to do was a settled matter, to make art in service of church and state. At time of the Reformation, it appears the artist's vocation was transitioning as a result of several internal and external influences. And 300 years after the Reformation, the destabilization of order and the rise of individual genius fueled the modernist concept of the avant-garde artist, a type of anti-hero, an agent of exception and antagonism. Especially in the last 200 years, modernist priority and modernist theory have crowded out the traditional understandings of artistic vocation. Is the artist a prophet, a provocateur, a theorist, a performer, a celebrity, a reactionary, an expressionist, a gorilla? a trickster, a shaman, etc., but probably not merely a craftsperson, a decorator, a painter, or a master. I simply propose this. The 21st century Christian artist is called by God and by some kind of patronage agency to use his or her God-given gifts to the benefit of others. The artist does not call herself and she does not use her vocation at the expense of community. This simple statement suggests that 500 years after the Reformation, the definition of vocation has not changed. Our vocations are God calling us to do his good work to serve others. On a personal level, 500 years after the Reformation, I find it helpful to be reminded by Vieth that every kind of work, including the work of an artist, is an occasion for priesthood, for exercising a holy service to my neighbor. I also appreciate Frederick Buchner's statement that vocation is the place where my deep gladness as an artist and the world's deep hunger meet. What is a Christian artist to do in the 20th, 21st century? As we examine what vocations mean in the 21st century, let's remember Christians and non-Christians alike are called to the same vocation. Luther famously proposed that Christian shoemaker, a uh, Christian shoemaker was called to make shoes, not Christian shoes. The Christian artist 
the Christian art student, should appear to all the world as a student first. The Christian artist should appear to all the world as an artist first. My experience as a Christian artist and a Christian art student tells me the actor in this situation is often not able to so easily separate or cleave his creed and ethos from his obligation. There lurks a tension to make ministry and evangelism out of every vocation. Maybe you've seen that tension demonstrated in the examples included in this show. The invitation to participate was received by me as licensed to exercise a Christian theological expression. Put yourself in the place of a confessional Lutheran Christian artist 500 years after the Reformation. He's been raised or accepted into a church fellowship that inherits five centuries of discomfort, sometimes becoming iconoclasm with the visual arts. He has visually been trained in the secular academy, where modernism's priority on originality and purity, which is directed against the decadent taste of society, has taught him to be true to a theory that is not understood outside the cultural elite. He may experience the churches against him, too, generally for being an artist, and specifically for being a modernist. He may experience the academy as against him, generally for being a Christian, and specifically for being anti-modern. His disposition or worldview is aligned with a biblical and catechetical foundation and the romantic notion of artist as subjective protagonist moves through his artistic practice. There are two things at work there. Personally, I am reminded of this push and pull every time I read the newsletter published by the art department's chair at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm pushed by the author's pluralist theoretical perspective and pulled by my own Christian understanding of truth. I have noticed an undercurrent in my own thinking that makes me align myself with aspects of Marxist theory. Like the Marxists, I find myself being critical of prevailing modes of artistic production and being resistant to comply with what prevails in society. I am to be in the world, but not of the world, equally as a Christian and as an artist. The Marxist in me does not want to conform to the system in which art produces a commodity, an object of desire to be consumed by a materialist culture. Just as the Christian rightly is a stranger in this world, so I speculate, as a true artist, I ought to struggle with and transcend what is natural to my time and offer my art as a moral critique of society and its injustices. Thankfully, my faith reminds me that I am not really a modernist. I'm not subject to the transcendent paradigm of the avant-garde. My faith reminds me my vocation is to make art in service to my neighbor, first and foremost. Like all Christian artists, I test myself with this question, because I must. Am I free to be an artist? The answer is yes, depending on my calling in the present. Like all Christian artists, I must ask this question next. What is appropriate or wise for me to accomplish in my artwork? The answer is, what is appropriate depends on my neighbor's need and on faithful stewardship of my gifts. Certainly, the Christian faith compels Christian artists to be moral and truthful, even about the ideologies of society. But there's no biblical script for the artist apart from what the Bible reveals about Christian virtues and character. The Christian artist who desires to create work that's explicitly Christian faces these challenges. Um, to place artistic excellence in a position where it's not displaced by priority, or by piety, excuse me, to, to maintain a priority for excellence. Uh, another one is to find an audience for the work at a time when patronage is mostly local and sporadic, and to be ready to face the opposition when critical theory is biased against the work. 
Before I move on to a related topic, I pause to speak more directly to Christian character and virtue ethics. My primary sources for this material are Stanley Hauerwas, who teaches at Duke, and Joel Bierman, who teaches at Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. Consider a pair of crucial assumptions. One assumption is what the Christian artist knows and believes as truth should not be separable from how she lives her vocational life. The other assumption is the Christian artist lives her vocational life in the daily renewal of her baptism. She is not required to appease God's judgment by the merit of her works. Both assumptions remind us we should first be concerned with who we are more than what we do. Since we are called and redeemed children of God, free to live out our earthly lives, and motivated in them by God's story of the gospel, we are obligated to each other and to the gifts we have received. We should aim to be equipped and ready as artists of Christian character, acting virtuously over the durations of our careers, because that is what kind of people we are. Five hundred years later, is being an artist a leap of faith? The quick answer is no, and yes. A leap of faith is an action in face of uncertainty. What can the Christian artist be certain of, and what remains uncertain? When we're being honest about ourselves and our limitations for understanding historical perspective and divine revelation, we humbly admit not much on earth is clear to us except what is in plain view, and even that can be obscured. What does it mean to be a Christian artist is usually answered by being hopeful about what we know from our own experience. 500 years after the Reformation, we can be absolutely certain about the story of God's love for all people, thanks to gospel restorative efforts of the Reformers. And we can be certain that all Christians have been called to the priesthood of believers, thanks to theological efforts of the Reformers. And we can be certain that God gifts some people with special artistic talent and uses artists to serve others and to advance his heavenly kingdom, the last not always thanks to efforts of the Reformers. Uncertainties usually have more to do with personal situations. So our certainty is objective, our uncertainty is usually subjective. I've always had my own devilish uncertainty, and I find it helpful to remind myself of the biblical account of Bezalel. Exodus 31, 1 through 12, tells us how God appointed Bezalel to become art director and general foreman for the tabernacle building project. This is the only direct mention by name of someone akin to an artist in the Bible. God told Moses that Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God and gifted with many artistic and intellectual abilities. Commentators notice two aspects about this account. The Israelite slave people were not experienced in the creative and productive work required by the Tabernacle Project, and God used Bezalel's talents and added to them special supernatural power. I notice some other things. I notice also artistic gifts are recognized as being godly and kingdom building. I notice also Bezalel's work required that he give concrete physical form to abstract non-material concepts. And finally I notice God specified materials, measurements, and special imagery, but Bezalel was allowed, allowed liberty with many artistic decisions. Oops, I'm one slide ahead here. I'm going back. Um, when I teach the lessons of Bezalel to design students, I ask them to consider the following questions. And I'll pose them to you as well, because my opinion is that the answers apply broadly to Christian artists of all periods. Is there something divine in all expressions of beauty? Yes, right? <coughs> If all that was created was good, 
And if man, including all his reason and imagination and abilities, was created in the image of God, then man's ability to create beautiful expressions, albeit dimly after the fall, reflects the goodness and beauty of creation and the creator. The something divine in all human expressions of beauty is part of the eternity set in man's heart by his creator. The something divine is apportioned to non-Christian and Christian artists alike, but the Christian sees beauty with greater meaningfulness and is freed to explore it in love and with faithfulness. What about the, so, the role of so-called self-expression in artistic vocation? Modernism, going all the way back to Renaissance precedence, placed ultimate priority on self-expression, usually at, at the expense of traditional values. Postmodernism, going as far back as Marcel Duchamp and the Dadaists, placed priority on a cool, neutral, ambivalent, or ironic kind of expression which still is a kind of priority for self-expression. Many Christian artists have inherited, by way of their era and their artistic training in the academy, an impulse to think of making art in terms of self-expression. Many Christian artists, um, yeah, I'm sorry, think of making art in terms of self-expression. Self-expression is a type of egoism, wanting to become egotism. Self-expression is encouraged by lack of patronage outside of the gallery marketplace, where individual style or brand is a commodity. Self-expression can be rightly practiced as a kind of virtue, being true to one's particular calling. But it also becomes a kind of vice if self-interest wins over interests of the community. I imagine that self-expression did not occur to Bezalel but to most artists before the Reformation, or to many artists even in our time from non-Western cultures. The Christian artist should remember expectations from a career field that conflict with the essential definition of vocation should not lead the person to sin against his vocation. And one last question. Who fits the artist for his high calling? Let me close by pointing us back to creation and redemption and to the transformation that happens in our vocations. The Christian artist sees all three persons of the Trinity in her calling. The Father who created her and the natural world and who does his hidden holy work of providence through vocation. The Son who took on human form and saved her and is served by hiding in the people that she serves and the spirit who breathes life, who breathes into her all life, material and spiritual, and sacrifices her intellect, sanctifies her intellect and intuition and body and vocation. So all three people, uh, all three persons of the Trinity participate. Bezalel was given extraordinary gifts of the spirit, and so in measure are we. 500 years after the Reformation, the Christian artist is having been blessed daily with a holy calling to make art. Thank you, and may God continue to bless his earthly kingdom with excellent Christian artists. questions right now. If you have questions for Paul, we'll take them into the gallery. But because we have so many artists here, I want you to have a chance to meet them and see their work. So you're all invited now to go into the gallery. We're going to have a little music by Ben Fogstead and, and Miss Dvorak, and we'll look at the art show. And I really appreciate everyone coming. Thank you so much. Hang out, talk to the artists, talk to each other, and uh, if you have any specific questions for Paul, I'm sure he would be happy to talk to you about those. So thanks, and we'll see you out in the lobby.